Welcome back to the DLC Book Club. I'm Jeff Kanata, and I'm joined by Lana Bashinsky. Hi, Lana. Hello. Good morning, I Jeff. You, <laughs> I caught you mid, I, mid I, beverage. I'm so used to DLC. I'm like, I got a whole other intro before you're going to talk to me. <laughs> well, my goodness. I'm so excited for this episode. So much to dig into. I think the book is like just kicked into another gear for mm -hmm. me. I don't know how you feel, but I'm so excited to talk about the book and well so this is the dlc book club we are currently working our way through the malazan books of the fallen by stephen erickson the first of those 10 tomes is called gardens of the moon that's the first novel and within that novel there are it is separated into books and we are up to book five which is called the gadrobi hills or Gadrobi Hills or Gadrobi Hills? What should we do? What, what do you decide? What do you think? I said Gadrobi. I think I initially went with Gadrobi. I kind of like Gadrobi though. The, the Gadrobi, spice it up. Yeah. That's, I feel like that's yeah. like the least intuitive way to say it. And so it sure, is. let's do but it. But so is Malaz. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That's an excellent point. That's got the same <laughs> ring to it. We're doing, what did you say? <laughs> Gadrobi. 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 No, um, Gadrobi. I wonder, I haven't even searched for this. I wonder if there's a pronunciation key for everything in this book online. Uh, I must be, it must be uh, frustrating for Mr. Erickson to uh, have everybody mispronouncing literally everything in his books all the time. I wonder if there's a pronunciation key. By the way, <laughs> so delighted uh, that uh, Mr. Erickson has has uh, commented on, on both of our videos so far. Yes. I mean, what a, what a... What a special thing and, and clarified some points that were so helpful for me, uh, some points that we were confused about in, in the previous book. Um, so uh, I, I'm grateful for that. Um, but bearing the lead <laughs> because our show has also kicked into a, another gear. Ladies and gentlemen, we now have a DLC book club theme song. Are you ready? The debut of the DLC Book Club theme song. When the world's too dark of a place to be And you need an escape from reality Open up those pages It's our cry or fantasy Whatever genre you please Now join a book club It's just some means doing them, but you're doing it with your friends, so join the book club by DLC. Woo! Yeah! Yes, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> courtesy of Emily Bashinsky, Lana's twin sister, and the amazing, incredible songstress that she is, uh, <laughs> made us a, 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 a theme song. So now, in the, it, when we start, you will have a, a couple of seconds to drink your delicious beverage <laughs> while the theme song. Uh, so excited about that. Thank you, Emily, for, for making that. I mean, Lana, uh, incredible. Uh, she's really amazing. There's been a couple of times in the last couple of years where, you know, my sister is this this musical force. She has a band, uh, Bad Buddy, that is like incredible music, but it, I've never sought to like lean on her musical skills until like for her work a couple of times, I on a whim was like, hey, what could you write me like a jingle? Uh, and she always says she rips them out in like a day, maybe two. This one took a bit longer, I think, because she had some uh, techno technical problems with some of the synths um, that she did to create that beautiful MIDI marimba bounty we just heard. But she writes it all. She records it all. She does every piece that you hear in the music is just what she ripped out. So Emily just B. So, so delightful. So wonderful. So incredibly talented she is. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I'm so excited. I feel like our show is a real show now. We have I a know. theme song. So um, that will be the, the song for the DLC book club going forward. I hope folks will uh, bop in their seat uh, like we are when we hear it. It's, uh, it's magic. <laughs> and uh, as has become our tradition here in the third episode, uh, we always start with a non-spoiler. You know, if you're reading the book with us, that's wonderful. Uh, it's awesome. We're going to keep reading through. Uh, we only have two episodes after this of, of this first book. It's crazy. I, that's crazy. 
We're almost done. We're almost done with the first book. But uh, <laughs> if you're not reading the book along with us, that's okay too. We want to have something at the beginning of uh, each episode uh, for folks that just enjoy reading or just hanging out with us and talking about reading. So we have some. Com- we have a community. Uh, DLC, the video game podcast that Lana and I do together, uh, has a built-in community and a Discord, which is five by five DLC on Discord. <laughs> and in that Discord, we have a book club thread. And in that book club thread, we have the Gardens of the Moon uh, subsection where folks have been uh, reading along with us, talking about their experiences and what they're uh, what they're enjoying about the book and what they're challenged by, all that stuff. It's fun to read. Um, but also, folks have uh, asked some questions or prompts for this first non-spoiler section. I particularly liked the post from TTT Bone who said... Curious if the hosts or anyone else ever takes breaks from a book partway through and starts something completely different. I finished the first Malazan book and I'm on to the second and I think I need a break for something a little more lighthearted. Ooh. Worried about losing momentum though. Just curious if others find it easy to switch between books, kind of like taking a break from a dramatic TV show to binge some comedies. I thought that was a great question. So Lana... What is your usual modus operandi? Do you, do, you, uh, do you stick with one book and power through or do you switch between multiple books? Uh, I'm going to say probably nine times out of 10, I stick with the book or because I like, I, because I read quite quickly, I usually set myself up. I'm like, what's a book series, which is why what we're reading together is fantastic for me. Uh, What's a book series? And I will read the whole series before I move on. Pretty rarely have I switched in between. More recently, I have started sort of doing two things at once. One book or book series that I'm reading and one audiobook. Mm. Or I guess maybe three because I also started reading like books about leadership. <laughs> for like right. I'm part of a, a, a leadership book club at work. So I sort of have three things going. I guess a non fiction <gasps> thing. Another book club? I know, I know. Oh, it meets like so... once a quarter though, so <laughs> and there's no theme song. So it's basically oh, garbage. Well, there you go. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> good. <laughs> um, so I one sort of non-fiction-y thing I'm reading, one fiction-y longer series, and uh an audiobook is sort of my that's the most sort of switching between things, but stopping a book it, like between two books in a series, I can't because I Really, I've gotten to the end of a book and being like, I don't want to keep living in this world. Usually, I power all the way through a series, and at the end, I take a week to mourn the fact that I can no longer live in the world that I just enjoyed for however long I did. What about you, Jeff? Boy, I'm I I envy that a little bit. I um, I am I find it very difficult to switch between things. Like if I'm reading a book. Usually that means that's my reading time. Like if, mm-hmm. if I have reading time, I'm going to be reading that book. I, 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 I'm perplexed by people that are able to be like, well, I'm going to read a little of this and a little of that and a little of this. I, I watch a lot of booktubers who are, who, you know, who are reading three or four different fantasy novels at the same time. And that is even stranger <laughs> to me because it, it, I feel like if I were to... <laughs> What I tend to do is, is maybe I'll have one fiction book and one nonfiction book that I'm reading. But mm-hmm. if I'm if I'm reading something, I have I have a desire to read something completely different next, you know, or it, it, the idea of concurrently reading things that are very sort of thematically similar or or stylistically similar is anathema to me. I, I don't I, <laughs> I, I don't understand it, but. Um, but uh, I do, I do oftentimes read a, a fiction and a nonfiction because I feel like that couldn't be farther apart on the spectrum for that. Mm-hmm. But I, I also envy the, um, the 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 ability to just like, well, what do I feel like reading today? I'll feel I'll read a little of this one, a little of that one, and I'm sort of juggling multiple storylines, which I've often reflected on that because I do that all the time with other medium, right? I'm watching multiple television shows that have ongoing narratives threats not like my brain is like oh i don't understand breaking bad because i'm watching succession you know it's i don't know why with a book i feel like oh it would be so hard to juggle multiple fantasy novels at the same time i will say with tv i don't like i switch because i have to 
you know? <laughs> right. The show comes out once a week or whatever it is. I I am forced to switch. Otherwise, I'm like, no, I'm not I'm not starting a show. There's a show that's got everything out. Guess what? I'm watching the whole thing before right. I do anything else. Yeah. Just finished Star Trek, Trek The Next Generation. Can't wait to finish Mandalorian season four or whatever it is. Like, but now you got to go into Picard if you just finished Next Generation. No, because Seven of Nine is in Next Generation. So I actually oh. have to go find wherever she's from. And then Smart. show characters in her show are from the other one. So I have to. I have a long way before Picard's on my list. <laughs> you're, yeah, you're <laughs> it's just, a problem. Really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I, I admire that. I also... I think what I honestly in the last um, few weeks I've decided that I want to do uh, the other part of your your plan that you mentioned, which is um, be reading a book physically mm-hmm. and listening to a different audio book. Yeah, I think you, I think that is something I want to start doing. Do you have one in mind? I don't. Oh. I don't. I have I have a bunch of contenders. But um, I I was thinking of doing. Um, people have been recommending, uh, and I know you wanted to read this uh, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow by uh, yeah. That was, I was just about to start. I bought it on my Kindle, and then you were like, "Do you want to be a part of book club?" And I was like, "Buy Malazan <laughs> or Malazan." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but I I'd be up for I'd be up for that. I I find um, you know how I I talked to you about my analysis paralysis of of deciding what to read next. Mm-hmm. That, that is even more compounded by audiobooks because there's another <laughs> layer it's like is it a good book but is and it then a also good... is it a good audiobook does it have oh a good reader you know is there a good... it so i, I think know. i talked to you about like my brandon sanderson audio reader woes yeah love them yeah. they're totally fine but that maybe you know i'll save it for my rec i think i just changed what book rec i'm going to recommend because <laughs> the audiobook is out of control good and I'll, oh yeah that, i'll oh, just good. tease that oh my god it was like my first foray into audiobooks and i'm like well i guess no my second my first one was the brandon sanderson stuff and i was like is this are they all like this Ugh. and then i listened to this other one i'm like are they all like this this is amazing and the answer is no to both <laughs> your uh your recommendation for uh lives of lock lamora last week i i listened to that one as an audiobook after i got my eye surgery um, oh. because i couldn't read or watch tv or do anything i literally just sat in the dark and listened to audiobooks for weeks um and uh, i think that might be why i'm not as high on that series as you and many others is because Mm. as much as i enjoyed it it was like tied to a very bad part of my life you know (laughs) but it was it was a good audiobook experience um but yeah my my wife used to come into the room and i'd just be sitting in the dark she's like are you awake and i was like yes (laughs) <laughs> listening to audiobooks. <laughs> anyway, uh, all right. Um, so that's uh, that is our experience of uh, you know being. I think we're both pretty um, committed to the thing we're reading. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't. Know, do you have any any sense of that same thing that I was expressing of of kind of having envy for people that are able to do? Or are you happy with your? I I have some envy for. Uh, my my mom, she is, she reads at a at a at a control levels of reading yeah. constantly. I'm like, oh, what are you reading right now? And she'll list like five things. She's part of four different book clubs with four different groups of friends, and then she has her cool. one or two books that she's reading for herself. And that you know, you're inclined to be like, oh, but you know, your mom and around. It's like, no, she's like, she's so busy. She does so much stuff constantly. I'm like, how are you reading seven books right now? And like lightning, like one or two days a book. Great. What a great book. Next. Amazing. Amazing. That is, that's the dream. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I, I'll never be that person for a while. I thought maybe I could become that person. I'll never be that person. I'm a slow (laughs) reader. I've, I've come to terms with it. I've accepted it. But I think the beauty of that is like, now we're having this experience, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I guess my mom gets that like times four, but uh, that's that's such a, that's a lot. But like reading slowly, but like the same way I look forward to this, the same way I might look forward to like an episode of something that's out on TV for my experience of being able to be like, oh, I can't know what to talk to you about this thing this week. Oh, Ooh. dude, this week. Okay. <laughs> I think it's time to get into it. Uh, it we will say spoilers <laughs> for book five. The Gadraby, Gadroby, Gadrabi G- Hills. G- Gadraby. Gadraby. I think Gadraby's cool. You don't, you're not on board with Gadraby. I like it. I'm practicing saying it. <laughs> uh, this is spoilers beginning now. 
But I got to tell you, Lana, this week was, I was, I was like, oh, I can't wait to talk to Lana about this one. <laughs> I feel like for the first time in this book, every single section was, was like a home run. I, I was just, mm-hmm. every part of this book, of this section, of this, these chapters, what is it? Chapters, what, 16, 15, 16, 17, 16, 17? I think 18, I, something like that. Anyway, I let them I'll, wash I'll over get it me. right. It'll be in the show <laughs> notes, correct? Book, book five. <laughs> book five. Um, I just was devouring it. I was, lo- I felt like it, we were, it was hitting on all cylinders. Everything was coming together. There was huge revelations. And for the first time, I think in the book, it, in the, in the novel, it sort of revealed the, the heart mm-hmm. of, of maybe the series, but certainly this first novel, the like the real themes that we're dealing with here and some really profound introspective moments that hit me hard and, and satisfyingly. Mm -hmm. Um, But what was your experience with uh, book five? Uh, Book five flew by. I hit that, that book six landing page and I was like, oh my God, are you kidding me? I'm not, (laughs) I'm not done yet. Let me give me more. So very exciting. Uh, There's like some. I do think it's good that we stop though, because there's things I said last episode that I wouldn't have said if I had already read this, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And so I'm glad we're like forcing ourselves to stop. So I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I like, and I'm, I'm so not good at compartmentalizing i'd be like i remember this thing and you'd be like i do not and i'd be like whoa (laughs) never mind um yeah yeah, and like some of the things that were dropped uh, it's interesting because i feel like the the pace of the book is such that when like these monumental things happen they happen pretty quick yeah the characters are like written being like shaken to their core you can tell somebody is like going through questioning their <laughs> existence, uh, questioning every choice that they've made th- leading up to this point. But it's like, oh my gosh, I just realized this thing. And then they're like, I'm as fast as you would think of something yourself. The character goes through that and, and realizes something and then their whole worldview has changed Yeah, in an instant. And then you're like, anyway, time to go look at what Cole and, and uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Marilio and uh, Groupie are up to. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, be right back, Lauren. Sorry about your crisis. Peace out. And the other thing that was so exciting about it is like knowing that all of them are like so close together, like physically in the the world, and seeing some of them meet for the first time was like just awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so awesome. I, uh, you know, th- we've talked a, a number of times about the reputation of this book and the series, but particularly this this novel, and. You know, th- there is this reputation that a lot of people uh, stop reading in, in the first half or find it find it overwhelming in the first half. And I, I think that's such a shame because, first of all, you know, and, and also the, the reputation of these books being really long and big. This book does not feel long. To, I, I can't believe we're we're like almost done with it because yeah. it feels so fast. It feels so like. Everything is it, it is now at a clip where it just feels like the the momentum that I'm riding is is exciting and exhilarating, but also none of it feels. I, I'm so it's, everything is so clear to me now. Everything I'm invested in these characters, and I feel like I haven't spent a ton of time with them. It doesn't feel like I have yeah lived through all this build up it just feels like we got to the good stuff so quickly and Mm -hmm. it's more good stuff yeah definitely i could see a version of this book where it'd be written that like you know a whole book is just from lauren's perspective yeah and like on one hand i'm sure that would be interesting she's obviously had this very fascinating life that she's lived as the the adjunct but because of the way she that she talks and the way that she uh, approaches situations and the things that she revealed like when she met Tattersail you see like just enough of like the key hits that would be like huge moments in the book that would just be Lauren and you're like yeah. I get you I get you again and like for me it does it always feels like it comes down to trust I feel like the author trusts we get it we get it yeah and I do yeah. I really feel like I do no I think you're right I think there there are fantasy entire fantasy series certainly fantasy novels that could 
just be the bridge burners mm -hmm. or could just be the Assassin's Guild stuff or just Lorne or just Sari. It's like the entire story of Sari. And we get this entire story of Sari so quick. You know, I'm sure there's going to be more to it, but I just feel like everything is so fat. It doesn't feel like a slog. It doesn't feel, uh, you know, um, tough to get through or, or drawn out. It, it, I feel, it feels like I'm getting whiplash almost, but in a good way, because it's, it, it just constantly is surprising me. There are things that feel like it could be like what has happened to Tattersale or what has happened to Sari mm -hmm. could be an entire book. Yeah. You, know, you could have this huge, long, drawn out thing. And it's, no, we're just getting the, the highlights of it. And it, it, it feels really exciting to be on that kind of roller coaster where all these characters are experiencing the biggest moments of their lives fast, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. But I, I loved how you brought up Lauren because it sounds like you had the same experience with this book, Edrabi Hills, as I did, which is Lauren has just like, catapulted into my one of my favorite characters in the book yes definitely i mean uh lauren and uh, i really i'm can't believe how bad with names i am when i'm reading names are like symbols and i'm like yeah that person and i just yeah. kind of move by it the person they refer to as the as uh ganus paran yeah paran. Paran. uh both of them i think had some really interesting stuff that i loved in this book yeah but, uh Lauren, I mean, we saw like a glimpse of it when uh, I want to say it was book three, where she sees Tattersale for quote unquote the first time and she realizes it's not the first time. And she has right. a moment where she's like almost losing control. And they're like, You are not Lauren. You are the adjunct. Act like it. And she's like, Yeah, you're right. And she just shuts it off. It's, it's gone. Yeah. That was and, an amazing scene. Yeah. And seeing that her having a different sort of loss of sort of control or like self-realization or this identity crisis she's experiencing once she gets to the um the buried obelisk or the the these caves with the Talanimas and realizing like who the these people are that were now extinct and what she's about to do and what she's about to unleash and basically questioning her whole existence was, it was powerful. It was amazing. Like what, what were you feeling and experiencing? Oh uh, yeah. I, I, that section, and it happens very early in this book, in this, these, these chapters, I was already like, Oh, Oh man, I loved that introspection and that realization. And it really felt like what I, what I was mentioning before about the, the sort of the heart and soul of mm -hmm. the message in this book, which is that realization that Lauren has of, oh, they're us, yeah. you know, like this warlike people that turn their back on uh, government and and any kind of system or structure. What this tyrant did, the reason the tyrant was the tyrant and had to be imprisoned is because he was he became human, human. and just did human stuff better than humans could. Mm -hmm. oh. And in fact, I think I, I highlight, hopefully this isn't your sentence from later, but um, <laughs> I highlighted uh, this, this, this is not my sentence for later, but a, an incredible sequence. Mm -hmm. um, she says, um, um, I know why we fear this Jaghut tyrant, because he became human. He became like us. He enslaved, he destroyed, and he did it better than we could. Yeah. Oh, oh. Gut punch, total okay. gut punch. That's such a beautiful line. And what a moment. And she's like, I don't think we should re release this, but we're still gonna. And the, and tool, the Talani Moss is like, uh, the, I mean, much later, we're kind of skipping ahead, but much later <laughs> when they're walking through the corridor and he's like looking at, which by the way, amazing imagery of the crimson writing in the depths of the ice. Like I could totally see that. And he, mm -hmm. and he's like, I read the words and I know who the tyrant is and this is going to be real bad. <laughs> it's going to be <laughs> real bad. Uh, it's, oh. it's kind of this beautiful journey where both of them are like, we don't want to do this, but they are so bound by their duty and their role to, you know, their respective people yeah. that 
they're like, we're going to do this. And he's like, but if you want, we could like peace out. Immediately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's like, and, or, or I could just do it and you could leave. Uh, yeah. And, like be safe. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. it's like, even, I mean, the concept of this cave and there's like, oh, time doesn't exist here. And she's like, how long are we going to be gone? And he's like, I don't, I don't know, man. <laughs> I, my favorite line is he goes, I've never done this before. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> uh, so amazing. And the, um, the, I love the construct of why Tool is able to even do this. The fact that the tyrant once unleashed, literally binds any Talan Imas that releases it. Like the entire clan uh, will be bound to the tyrant, but Tool is the last survivor of his clan. So he's uniquely qualified because he would be the only one destroyed by it. He would be the only one consumed by that because mm -hmm. he's not tied to anybody else. I like that was a really cool explanation of why like he's willing to do it and and uniquely suited to do it yeah when given know. the choice to like basically put destruction upon your whole people or sacrifice yourself because you're the only qualified person it's yeah. just it's so interesting because in the book people talk about the talani mass with like such fear slash reverence slash I, it's like hard to get a read on it, especially Lauren is like, oh, this crazy thing is next to me. And he's just like dropping knowledge constantly. Yeah. So she's kind of afraid of him, but kind of revering him, but kind of like, oh, he's so annoying. He hasn't moved at all. Not even an inch kind of thing or like the, yeah. the he literally like just the squatted for two days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just like, oh, that's got to hurt. You know, oh, I guess he's yeah. just bones, but you know, I, I'm feeling it. <laughs> yeah. And then meanwhile, you know, Lauren goes and she starts having this realization about like, like the tyrant being just human, more human, the worst of humanity. And she's like kind of going on a stroll around this thing, waiting till the time is right from this Talan and then runs into like the other adventuring party and immediately is like, kill, kill, kill kind of mode, just yeah. immediately starts fighting them. So the second that I think it's Crocus is like, can we not? She's like, uh, yeah, yeah, we cannot. And they're like, okay, like bleeding out. Like, well, don't then. And she's like, well, don't come close. And they're like, we won't, lady. And she's like, bye. It just pieces out because she's like having this thing, but she goes into like her 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 dutiful mode and just starts trying to kill people again immediately. It's like, but that's the whole point, ah, stupid. And they're just like, what the hell is that? <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I I thought that was really awesome. I, I think in a lesser novel or uh, in, you know with with lesser skill, I, that moment would feel really false and weird. Like she attacks them and then immediately regrets it and lets them go. It it, it kind of <laughs> it, it would feel uh, arbitrary and and goofy in a way. Uh, mm -hmm. But somehow in the context of this writing and because of how these characters have interacted and and we're inside Lauren's inner monologue. Like a second, yeah, I totally that. bought it. I yeah. totally bought it, and I was like, "Yeah, of course." She had this moment of lashing out, and then it's sort of part and parcel with the struggle that she's having. This sort of violent, the violence of the world, and her going, "No, there's literally no reason for me to have attacked them. What was I doing? Mm -hmm. It would have been, it would have been fine, you know." Yeah, they and didn't know that... I was doing anything. You know, they just <laughs> were just strolling through here. Yeah, and part of that is like, is it just that Crocus looks like so sad and vulnerable? Is it that he's the coin bearer and there's some amount of magic or godly assistance behind anything that he's doing? Like knowing that he is the coin bearer, every situation you're in is like, how is this being affected by the gods? Is it just when it's really explicitly called out, like ducking to grab the coin? Or is right. it at any point, you know, there's a coin flip happening at every decision point as to who's going to win and what's going to be the situation that he's up against. So even the fact that he was the one to stop it makes me be like, well, was that godly assistance or was it really just that Lorne was having this moment? Maybe both. Yeah. I think that's a great point. I, and I love that, that always and and even the characters are thinking like how much is opon influencing these events how much are the gods influencing the events like what i love that interplay between mm -hmm. the gods and the and the and and not there isn't a clear power structure we'll get to what Peron does in in the context of literally like 
bullying a god. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, we we've talked about um, the um, Murillo, Krupi, uh, you know, Crocus, Cole, that, yeah. Cole, that group. They're all sort of protecting the the coin bearer and and headed out there. Uh, we talked about Lorne and Tool. The third group that's also headed to the Gadrabi Hills is Haran and Talk the Younger. Talk. Yeah. Now, Talk, so there, I thought that was even awesome where they're like w w walking through the plains and uh, just coming on to dead ravens that Hairlock has been <laughs> shooting out of the sky the whole time and going, this is probably bad you know the, <laughs> not a good sign to see great ravens dead strewn through the you know dozen and, of them not just dead but like looks like they're inside they were turned inside out <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah you know not not a great sign not a great uh, not a great <laughs> we talking omens seems like a bad one seems Feels like, like a bad one continuing to walk this direction not the greatest idea and then uh, of course hairlock does show up and is like i'm gonna kill all you guys Tosses talk into a uh, into a warren. Mm -hmm. I feel pretty confident that's not the last we've seen of talk. Yep, they're like he's dead. I was like, is he? I <laughs> yeah, I don't know yeah. if that's true. He seemed pretty powerful to me. Uh, All right. uh, but um, you know, uh, Perrin's uh, sword <laughs> chance super cool. I love how again this is skipping forward a little bit, but I love how Perrin. Perrin is not directly under the influence of Opon, but his sword is. Like, yes. his sword. That's so cool. It's so ridiculous. Like, <laughs> ri like ridiculous, not silly, but, or like, worthy of ridicule, which I guess is literally the word, but like, ridiculous that you think of that nuance when writing this book. And like, yeah. what an interesting twist on like, he is, he, or I guess at some point he was controlled like uh, as a right. as a pawn but he no longer is but the sword still is though <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's just so funny oh, it's so cool and so uh hairlock shows up and then we have this cool situation I, I thought the pacing of this the mm -hmm. the visualization of this where we have quick ben sitting down and doing his stick magic whatever that is is like houses you know summoning and circle Kind yeah. of, yeah. Uh, He's creating, which, I, I pictured like creating the marionette, like sticks that you control marionette with. Right. Which, and sort of making this connection to Hairlock as, as sort of what he promised to the Shadow God. Yeah. And then, you know, we, so we're, we're cutting back between him sort of seeing Her what, what's going on with Hairlock, going, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm paying off my deal to, uh, you know, send the hounds. Send the hounds to, after uh, after Hairlock, and then Hairlock's like, "Ah, I was gonna kill you guys, but uh, these hounds are here. Peace out!" And he starts running, and then he snips the strings, and he's like, I, "It's such a great visual of this like puppet just going, ah, oh no!" Uh, Hairlock is such a little gremlin too. Every scene he's been in is just like, eh, meh, like running around, being, like, "I'll get, I do what I want," and everybody's like, "Okay." <laughs> Chill out, man. He's like, never, like diving back into magic <laughs> shit. Sorry. And then he comes. It's I don't, just so funny. I kind of don't get his deal a little bit because I know that he's <laughs> he's going slowly insane by walking in the chaos, Warren. Mm -hmm. uh, so part of his actions are just crazy. But, mm -hmm. but I also kind of don't get his, maybe you can explain his, his intense desire to kill Peren is just a, because... He was with working with Opon. He was a, a, um, a pawn of Opon. Yeah, I think uh, he was a pawn of Opon, and he, I, I, so <laughs> I'll probably get it wrong now. So I felt like his sort of resentment and all everything that he was feeling was from bef before. You know, he gets it seemed he gets sliced in half. He's in this puppet. I imagine he's just seeking revenge and seeking power. Based upon, he's like, now I'm in this puppet body. I'm basically indestructible. Ha ha ha. Like nobody can catch me. Plus the, just the, the manic nature of, of being in the Warrens and going more magically crazy, sort of losing grip on reality. And now, um, you know, he's sort of seeking his own powerful and everybody's like, he's super powerful. That guy cannot keep going on, but he seemed like he had the power to become a big player, another Anamander Rake style 
mm-hmm. god, pseudo god champion in this world, but he didn't like have the mental capacity for it anymore. And he let like this moment of of focus come down to, hey, you were there and you stopped that wolf from killing you. And so now I'll finish you off because I'm that he just seemed like that. I guess the action seems somewhat arbitrary, but mostly fueled by like manic revenge for the sake of it. Yeah. And that's why he's like, ah, I'll get you later. Peace out. And then. <laughs> he, he yeah. Can't. And then <laughs> it's so, it's so cool. He gets betrayed by uh quick Ben uh, and uh, to pay off, you know, quick Ben's deal with shadow throne. Mm-hmm. And then he gets ripped to shreds by hounds feels to me pretty final for, for hairlock. Yeah. That feels like a real death death. Mm-hmm. Hairlock seemed like, like to me, he read as like an artifact from, from a time that started before we the book began, mm-hmm. and so he was just his character feels like an interesting, weird thing that people are like that he definitely cannot be like be allowed to keep get gaining power. Everybody kind of knows he's super powerful. That's going to be bad because he's a bad dude and he's only in it for himself and so he seemed like a means to an end of of basically the motivation is just that he needs to die to have the moments that we saw following yeah. it. uh and then of course you know the hounds are there and they're like we mm-hmm. killed the hairlock might as well kill everybody else too uh <laughs> and well, gear uh, is there and so it's not necessarily oh, right. arbitrary gears like, right that's he stabbed me straight he up. stabbed me good yeah <laughs> Uh, that's true. Good point. Um, and then it, of course, Anna Mena Rake shows up and, uh, Anna Mena Rake, we've seen very, very infrequently, incredibly cool, so incredibly dope. cool. <laughs> just a uh, badass. Just a badass. Um, <laughs> and, uh, comes down and literally, uh, tells the, tells the hounds to leave and tells Shadow Throne to show up. And leave, uh, pull Cotillion out of sorry. So this is mm-hmm. one of the things that uh, Mr. Erickson uh, clarified last episode that I had wrong. I think we both had wrong. Is that sorry was not possessed by Shadow Throne directly. Mm-hmm. It was Cotillion who is a underling, uh, an associate of Shadow mm-hmm. Throne. And so Shadow Throne's like, hey, Anamander, dude, I'm not even involved in this. The, the hounds were pissed because he stabbed them. Uh, Cotillion is the one doing everything with sorry. I, I'm not even involved. Why are you so mad? And he's like, well, okay, if you're not involved, then call Cotillion back. He's like, ah, all right. And so Cotillion is is pulled out of sorry. Mm-hmm. Which, which, again, go ahead. I was not at all expecting that to Me be Me neither. Case. When he's like, oh, pull Cotillion out, I was... I actually was like, mm, sorry's going to be so pissed. And I was like <laughs> looking forward for her being like, I just want to kill this guy. And things keep getting in the way. But it's like, no, possession exercised. And Sorry's just like, oh, where the hell am I? Who am I? What's <laughs> happening? I did not at all think that that was going to be what pulling Cotillion out implied. That uh, that Google Doc that I've been uh, re- reading that it summarizes each chapter, I've been posting them at the in the in the um, comments of all the videos, uh, has the best description for her. Uh-huh. Now they call her "Sorry, Not Sorry." Oh, <laughs> sorry, not sorry. <laughs> so perfect. Uh, That's cute. But yes, I mean, what it, I I really thought that sorry as this agent of. Uh, not chaos, but but darkness, you know, murdering people, really kind of, you know, playing the bridge burners off one another, mm-hmm. do, doing things in the shadows, murdering people. I thought that was going to be a long play. I mm-hmm. thought we were going to see a lot more of that. And to, to see that pulled out of, sorry, and now she's back to being the, the, the girl, Fisher the girl. Little, yeah, the little Fisher girl that we saw in the very first scene. Or I guess second scene technically, but mm-hmm. um, I, that was a shock to me that how quickly and and I think that's kind of what we were talking about before. Like st- the setups and payoffs happen so quickly, you think, oh, this is a ten book series is going to be long, 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 and I just feel like everything is bam, 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 and 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 there's something very exciting about that to me. Um, but do you feel uh, at all any kind of um? loss of 
Because Sari was kind of a rad character. Yeah, I uh, I feel like I don't feel a loss because I feel so confident that you know we're not done with Cotillion either. That I'm like I don't know if yeah. they'll possess Sari again or what. But the <laughs> I'm kind of enamored with Crocus being you know a young dum dum, being like uh oh pretty girl. Suddenly here, and even touching like, my arm. <laughs> it's like I can't even enjoy it because I know that she was that killer, but is she? And then, and then, him, him her being like, "I don't know what my name is. Do you know any names?" And he's like, "Chalice." And she's like, "What?" He's like, "Nothing, nothing. You can't have that one." Like <laughs> that so he's like, good. he like doesn't. He can't think of anything else. It's just like such a funny, like weird, like sitcom peel away into like, like fantasy. <laughs> like adventuring duo of like awkward teenage boy being like, oh, you're pretty. Don't kill me, please. Uh, it's like such a funny right. thing. I don't feel like we've lost Cotillion being like a cool. There's there's so much darkness and there's so many cool sinister people that having like these like almost like comedic relief, although they have yeah. their very serious story as well. It's like it's a nice like d- a tonal difference between what else is happening. It's like yeah. complete ignorance is bliss. Sorry, literally has no memory now. It's great. There was a um, quick side story. Uh, when I was in college, um, <laughs> we were playing uh, the game Celebrity. Have you played Celebrity? You know Celebrity. Uh, it, you, everybody, I think you probably have a different name for it. But you put it on your everybody forehead? puts names on a piece on pieces of paper. And they put them in a hat. And you, oh, you, yeah. You pull them out as fast as you can. And you give you know little clues. And your team is trying to guess. Well... You know, we played celebrity, and it, it, the rule was a name anybody that everybody would know. So it could be, you know, a famous person, it could be a, a fictional character, or it could just be someone in the world that we all know, like a friend. And uh, I was on a team, and I was one of the guessers, and somebody was playing, uh, you know, giving the clues, and they pulled out a thing, and they said, um, uh, "Pretty girl from your class." And I shouted out this girl that I had a crush on. And they're like, no, but that's revealing. And it just made me, I was like, jealous. Yeah, yeah. yeah, jealous. And they're like, wait, what? And you're like, you said that, not me. I, I, yeah, I mean, I was just guessing. She's pretty, pretty. I don't know. <laughs> was so that anyway, bait? That, what was the answer? It was just a, it, it was actually, um, it, it was, was like a, the, it was a different girl who was pretty, and like, the person thought that they were pretty, but it wasn't <laughs> the girl that I was. She present? Like, she was not present. Oh, she was not present. I was no. a, about to be a meat cute. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been even more embarrassing if it was like ah, she's sitting right next to me. I just shouted your name out. <laughs> My favorite part is that I don't know how many years later you still won't just say her well, name. Why? Yeah, I don't. It's not. <laughs> What if she's listening? She'll know I had a crush She'll know. on her. <laughs> uh, very funny. It was very funny. Uh, and I was mortified. But anyway, that was the uh, chalice moment where he's like, yeah. you could come up with a name, any name, with a chalice. It's chalice. <laughs> no, not. Uh, yeah. I but also the funny. fact that he's like keeping his options open. She's like, is this your girlfriend? And he's like, absolutely not. <laughs> Why? <laughs> you you interested? It's like the most teenage boy. <laughs> Yeah, so funny. And she, uh, I don't. She's like, well, let's camp. And how many bedrolls do you have? Just one. Just one. I'll sleep on. The, it's okay. I'll sleep on the dirt. And she's like, oh no, no, it's cool. It's cool. It's cool. Just sleep in the bedroll with me. Just you know, no funny stuff. And he's like, yeah, sure. And of course, no it's funny. <laughs> he's like partially teenage boy, partially like you might literally murder me. But I'm like still turn on. Let's go and do it. It's worth the risk. It's worth the risk. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that was all adorable. Um, I, I very much hope we end up getting a scene where, uh, what's her, I can't even remember her name now, uh, because of an A, uh, Absalar, Absalar. Oh, yeah. Uh, where I, I hope Absalar, uh, is delivered back to the bridge burners and Whiskey Jack's like, all right, where's my cool killer? Wait, what? And she's like, I'm just a fish girl. And he's like, well, I, I hope that that happens. I want, yeah. I want Whiskey Jack to be like, that's not the scary girl that I remember. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so the n- next thing that happens is uh, uh, good news. Uh, what's that? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. 
No, what were you saying? What were you saying? I was to say, isn't the next the next big thing in my memory is is Paran chasing them? Or that's uh, what I was going to say. Is that is is Paran being like, man, Anna Mender murdered all oh, those hounds. What a bummer. Uh, it's such a bummer that everybody that I come into contact with gets murdered. Even these pretty, pretty animals. So pretty. I'm just going to stick my finger in their blood. <laughs> <laughs> so, so pretty. Look, just squish. And then this will be he's... totally fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, he is pulled into a Warren. It is the Warren. Now, one of the other criticisms i've heard about this book and this series is uh, or this novel in the series is um that the magic system is confusing i'm not confused by it no me neither the warrens seem very clear to me uh i mean there's some stuff i still don't know obviously but i don't mm -hmm. i'm not baffled by how the warrens work i i get they're the source of magic there's different ones associated with different things and different people can access different ones i but can see how like like having different names, it's like, why would you, should I know what Fear Warren is compared right. to Shadow Warren? And I, for me, I'm like, those are just magic names. So they're just types yeah. of magic in the Warren. But I can imagine somebody reading through and being like, well, which one's the Fear one? And like mm. trying to, yeah, feel I guess. Like, I feel like they should have known what Fear or where Fear is or anything about it. But I just, I think the I, important thing I is that they're it, different. But, yeah, and that's right. They're it. different from each other. They're distinct, and then mm -hmm. cer certain ones are associated with certain people, and certain ones are associated with certain deities and certain old, you know, like the Tilana Moss had a certain kind. And so, anyway, I love the fact that Anamander Rake's sword has its own Warren. Yes, and this the, a Dragnapur, I believe it's called. Mm -hmm. uh, the sword is so awesome. This is the sword that was forged before gods existed. That's amazing. Um. And its its whole deal is that if it slays you, not only are you dead out of this world, you are <laughs> trapped in a real bummer of a warren, uh, a warren where you're tra you're chained to a giant wagon and having to pull it for all eternity. Uh, it feels like a version of hell to me. And <clears throat> I mean, already we're we're looking at the title of book of novel ten being the chained god. Clearly Chains. foreshadowing that. Yeah. Uh, but I thought that just that concept of the sword has its own Warren. And when you get smitten, smite, smited, smoted, uh, when it smites you, when it, it, you get pulled into this hellish chained world. And it, there's all these people that Anamena Rake has defeated over the many, many years. Uh, just all there, just living that chained life. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't know the the visuals of the whole thing of even being like, okay, there's this wagon and everything around it sort of recedes into darkness. So Paran's there yeah. being like, geez, this is crazy. And he's like, where are these? Where these chains are here? He talks to somebody who's like, I've been chained here for psh, nigh on eternity. And then he's like, you seem like some puppy dogs. <laughs> like, oh yeah and they like come in from the outside being like we we're here <laughs> like there's just like everything that's out that the chains cascading into basically oblivion darkness yeah like uh, under the wagon he goes underneath mm -hmm. the wagon and it's cold and dark and there's ice crystals and water and it's, it's, it's just so rad and there are some scaly bones in the wagon like you're dragging other souls that i don't i don't know how you get to be the skelly bones riding the wagon seems i don't know if that's better or worse than dragging the wagon but <laughs> yeah it feels a little better to me i don't know it's still bad yeah but you're, yeah, but you're skelly bones you're skelly bones bad not good uh and then you know paran <laughs> because he has uh, this rad sword literally uh, uh, uh opon half of opon the 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 boy half of opon shows up and he's like where are them hounds and literally oh, yeah, forces Opon. what sorry i just forgot who he talked to yeah sorry continue yeah he grabs opon and and uses opon as bait for the hounds and then right. like pulls him out of the way at the last second so the hounds leap into the darkness which ostensibly like saves the hounds or at least gets them out of there right well that's like the root of the chains like where all the chains chained to it's like this oblivion hole like a black yeah. hole under the middle of the wagon and so 
Opon's like, yep, that'll that'll be the way to do it. If you can do it at all, I don't actually know. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure that's the way. And so the hounds jump into where the chains come from, and we don't actually know the result. Well, we do know that their bodies are no longer in the real world. So Yes, yeah. I, I, my assumption was that they have been returned to the mortal the plane shadow. or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, or the, yeah, they have been, they're no longer dead uh, or whatever, um, mm -hmm. which I thought was really cool. <laughs> um, and then things get even crazier because I felt like, okay, that was crazy. <laughs> but then he keeps walking and we're like, why are we still hanging out with Perrin? Perrin? And then he gets like the, the crazy buffalo herd uh, mm -hmm. uh, that have an awesome name that I can't remember. Um, and then he, he comes, uh, into contact with the Rivi people. Now I did not get, I did not get what seems in retrospect obvious that mm. the little girl was Tattersail until it revealed it. And it was a gobsmack moment for me. Did you, did you, I feel like in <laughs> retrospect, I was like, oh, it was so obvious. It was her. We've been told that she was reborn into a little kid and the little girl and walks up and is like wise beyond her years and awesome. But uh -huh. I didn't even get it until, until way later. Oh, <laughs> the, really? Near the end of that sequence where uh, right before he says Tattersail, I was like, oh my gosh, it's Tattersail. And it felt like the coolest reveal to me. Uh, but I maybe mean, you were smarter than I am. <laughs> basically, as soon as she was like, there's somebody you care about and she's fine. I was yeah. like, oh, that's Tattersail for sure. I was still like, for who? Sure. who could that be? Who is it? <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, he had he had sex with Tattersail. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. He, and the, but Their I still relationship like the happened super quickly for me. Yeah. But there's a couple of times where Tattersail was like, he's pretty hot. Nah. And then like right before they pieced out, she's like, should we bang? Ah, okay, fine. And <laughs> But like, I couldn't tell how much like time they spent together before that because clearly they were both like super into it. I can't tell yeah. if they were both like, we're so hot. And then they like go off or whatever. He saw her in like a makeup finally and was like, oh, you're beautiful <laughs> or whatever. Um, but then he, like we know he felt for her because he, he was so struck by her death. I'm like, oh, the relationship was deeper than I expected it to be. So as soon as like this woman you cared for, there's no other woman that was ever sort of called out as something he cared yeah. for. Um, no, I definitely but... realized I should have gotten that way quicker than I did. But I have to say. <laughs> I don't think you should have. I think, I think you probably had it in the most exciting possible way of being like, "Oh my god!" Yeah, she no, was that is born. That is the uh, the benefit of my stupidity is that uh, <laughs> the real realization was really awesome. I was like, "Oh snap!" And then, like the way that little section ends, where he's like, "Daughter sail," and she's already gone. Ah, oh, that was mm -hmm. cool. So cool. Yeah, even um, the descript, like the visual description of the Rivi people, was very cool as well. Like, of, have, like they have like the woven, threads. yes, oh, yeah. so cool. Ooh, very interesting. In their face, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, a promise that they're that's not the last time they're going to see each other. She's like, I'm going to grow up some more. <laughs> see you in a little. See you on the flip side. Pick up where we left off. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I'm six. Not cool right now. Um, so. Uh, <clears throat> Then, you know, and I'm like, wow, how is this? I, that felt like the end of the book. That felt like, oh, this is where you end the book. I don't, there's more? <laughs> I'm surprised there's more. Uh, and then, of course, we get to what might be my favorite scene in the entire book, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, Cole and Perrin. <laughs> First of all, I loved all the stuff setting up Cole being left behind where Marilio's like, what? Why are we leaving him? And he's like, it's cool. He'll, he'll be fine. He's, he's like, don't worry about it. He's going to be okay. It, mm -hmm. There's just a murderous psychopath <laughs> there. And he's like, oh, I, okay, fine. But all right, all right, cool. He's like, and also with Talana Moss. And really, I was like, what? Also yeah. with Talana Moss? <laughs> uh, but um, <laughs> but the, yeah, he's all by himself. And we get, we, Perrin like stumbles upon him and they have like this cool soldier bro relating uh, to each other moment. Ah, so rad. I loved it because like, even though, you know, Perrin has come up to this, this point 
where you know he's like a captain in the army like he and being a soldier is all he's ever wanted to be since he was like a petulant little noble even so there's we haven't really seen him like be competent we saw right. him sort of by chance wink stab gear when gear came to attack and then we saw him get killed by sorry and then not killed by sorry and he really has felt very pawny up till this point mm -hmm. but then seeing him get to the fire well seeing him fight the rivy when the rivy first appeared it was like oh he actually does know how to fight cool yeah that and fight then was he, rad yeah and and then he gets to the fire and he's like this is what soldiers do i have all this claw training oh i know how to speak these languages and being like, I'm not going to be like, what happened to your leg, man? Because that's not what soldiers do. Soldiers look the thing in the eye and then talk about everything else around it because the obvious yeah. doesn't need to be said. And sort of seeing into his training and his mentality there and sort of this unspoken like uh, rule of communication between soldiers is uh, very, very cool. I really loved it. I agree. I agree. And you're, you're, you're right to bring up that fight. I we I totally skipped over it, but I thought that fight was awesome. I especially love the idea that the sword, because it is still oh, yeah. being controlled by Opon, <laughs> literally blocks five uh, spears that are thrown at him by itself, and they're they're like split Smashed. on. Oh, so rad, so cool. And he's like, "Oh wow, look at that! All these spears <laughs> that were going to kill me." And the review's like, "Huh." Oh, okay. All right. Five yeah. times you tried to, we tried to kill you and five times it didn't. Anyway. Um, yes. I love the, I love everything you said about the, um, that, that bond they have, that military uh, interaction that they have, that knowing how to inter interface with one another. And, and, and then we get the big reveal of Cole, which sort of been, had been hinted at only briefly about like getting his title back, but him having a whole backstory and he was just the, the goofy drunk in so many of the scenes at the beginning of the novel. And now mm -hmm. we realize why he was like that. I just, so, so cool. Yeah. The depth added to the characters again in this, what feels compared to everything, every other monumental thing that happened in this book. Like you said, at the top of this thing, every moment felt exciting and jam packed and cool. There's something amazing happening on every page. And my my favorite sentence is from this conversation um, that these two have. I just, it, I love it. And again, it was like kind of a sweet, a really sweet flavor to end the whole. I agree. Book the on. perfect little end to this to this book, um, and really satisfying and really, uh, you know, after all of this sort of bombastic, high octane stuff earlier in the book to end on this, these two guys around a campfire. I was like, yeah. Yeah, and they're gonna trust each other. You know, it's ah, so cool. And my guess is that you know, Cole was betrayed by a lady of the evening. Mm -hmm. uh, the only one of those that we have seen is that lady Simtal chick that mm. um, what's his name was trying to trying to maybe murder. But that, but we know that because he was trying to murder her to get the dudes to get revenge for Cole. Right, that's mm -hmm. this whole thing is like, it's it's another one of those things we talked about a lot less at last episode that Erickson does so well, letting us make those connections and going, oh yeah, we already know that he was going to murder her. From awesome. <laughs> uh, all right, yeah. so let's um let's wrap things. I I mean this I I feel like we're in the last two books now. Things are just like crescendoing, and it feels really exciting. Um, do you have any? Things you want to see, hopes or guesses. Oh, yeah, hopes and dreams. Yeah, How do, uh, I'm always. I don't. I'm, I don't want have any guesses, and especially knowing you know that there's books coming after this. My guess is that the end of this book will not feel like ah, oh, and that put a nice bow on this. Oh, the, <laughs> right. oh, the thing. Oh, I guess the guess that I have is like there's one line in there that was like, oh, I heard moon spawns over Darugistan now, and I'm like. That thing, I guess it's floating. It's like this chunk of rock floating around. It's just, it's it's over Darugistan now. I feel like there's going to be some kind of tension between Moonspawn and Darugistan. That's like my biggest quote unquote prediction. I don't think that was handed to me in a sentence in the book. So I don't know if that's like a guess for what's going to happen. But my yeah. guess is that by the time this book ends, we'll be just as hungry to start the next one and have just as many interesting threads to sort of 
keep following yeah. by the time we get there. I think we're I think the second book leaves this continent and goes to the the Malazan Empire it specifically. Oh, uh, I right, think right, that's right. what I've heard. So and then book three we come back to this this side. Mm-hmm. Um all right. So what is your, we, we, we started this thing last episode. We're going to keep doing it. We're going to pick out our favorite sentence of the section that we've read. Um, you, you can start. Uh, th- these, I mean, we, the language Erickson uses throughout is so good. So we've each picked a favorite sentence from this section. So my favorite sentence is not because of the language, but because of what like the feeling that it evokes and experiences I even had in my life that I'm like, yeah, definitely. This is when Cole and Paran are talking around the fire and Paran's like, well, here's my spiel. And then Cole says, truth as bald as that makes a challenge, don't it? Oh, I also loved that sentence. That was one that stuck out to me. It was in a, a contender. Oh, yes, so good. Truth as bald as that makes a challenge. Oh, like so you, good. And it, being in a situation and somebody is like, here's the most honest, crazy things about me. And, and I feel like humans are inclined to be like, well, I'll tell gotta, you something crazy. I'll tell you some truth. And I got to match that. I got to be honest. Yeah, so good. Yeah, love it. Love it. So good. Um, my favorite sentence of the section was um, this uh, italicized thoughts that we have from Lauren's um POV, and she says, through the gamut of life, we struggled for control, for a means to fashion the world around us, an eternal, hopeless hunt for the privilege of being able to predict the shape of our lives. Mm. Ah, that notion that we, all we want, we, we just, we, 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 we strive to get some sort of control over things just to think that we're going to have any kind of influence over the shape of our lives, but it's, it's a lie. There's, no, there's none of that. That's so good. I love that your sentence is that from the, the front end of the chapter, from the, of the book, and mine is from the end. Because I almost yeah. feel like the beginning, you know, we're with Lauren discovering and realizing the worst of what humanity has to offer. And the end of the book, we're at this simple moment where two people who could very reasonably be enemies and, and by all like empire lives should be enemies decide to be friends. And it's lovely. Uh, dude, I'm loving this book. Uh, but we have some other recommendations as our, uh, as, as our tradition is uh, at the end of the episode. And I'm a, uh, I'm running late. I got to go pick up my daughter from daycare Mm -hmm. or from uh, school. But uh, let's hit some uh, a book recommendation that is not a Malazan book of the fallen. Yeah. So my quick recommendation that I pivoted to when you're looking for your next audio book, it is young adult, but it uh, it is Sabriel by Garth Nix. There's six in the series, but the first three, the audio book is read by Tim Curry, and it is out of control wow amazing voice acting and such a fun fun series and just a great audiobook because you can yeah you really want to keep listening tim curry is just excellent and the writing is lovely so that's sabriel by garth nix it's about uh a young woman who is a necromancer um and necromancer in her case is like a positive thing fighting the dead in this world um there are evil evils among it as well but it's it's very very cool um super super easy read because it is a young adult but like the language is beautiful the characters are wonderful very fun awesome very good recommendation i love that tim curry's doing audiobooks um i'm gonna do one that's a little self-serving i'm gonna pivot as well and do one that's a little self-serving and that is (laughs) a book called Traveling in Space by Stephen Paul Leva. The audiobook was done by me. <laughs> I did the audiobook. Uh, and uh, I really enjoyed doing it. I did like over 200 characters, I think, or something crazy like that. Um, but it's a book I genuinely would recommend, even if I wasn't involved with it at all. A really clever, funny book. Science fiction, the notion is that it's a first contact book. So it's the first time humans contact aliens. But in this book, 
it is told from the perspective of the aliens. So it's all about these alien species making contact with human beings and just being completely baffled by what human beings are about. Just and, and it's a really wonderful way to kind of poke fun at and look with introspection at all of the weird things that we do as humans. Like if you, if if an alien species were to arrive on Earth and check us out, they would be confused by a lot of things that we take for granted. And I think that's what this book is allowed to do is look at things and go, what? Why do we do that? Uh, and it's really fun and funny. And if you do the audiobook, I'll probably get like a quarter. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, go for yes. it. Support uh, your local Jeff Kanata. <laughs> <laughs> it's a genuinely cool book. So even if you read it without the audiobook, I think you would like it. It's, uh, it's called Traveling in Space by Stephen Paul Leva. All right, that's uh, this episode of the book club. We got a new theme song. We're rolling forward. We're into book six of Gardens of the Moon. I hope you're enjoying it. I hope you're sticking with us. We'll see you next time. I'm going to do it again. When the world's too dark of a place to be And you need an escape from reality Open up those pages It's our cry or fantasy Whatever genre you please And join a book club Cause you won't read it on your own Join a book club So you'll be held accountable It's just some means to the mouth But you're doing